Okay, welcome back after the break. Um, just before we went for our break, uh, we began looking um, in the previous lecture. Uh, we started looking, uh, we began looking or studying chapter 7. We're basically talking about the purpose of the incarnation. We're looking at what was the purpose of the incarnation? Why did Christ have to become man and take on the fullness of humanity? Um, what was God doing through humanity, uh, the humanity of Christ that he could not do in any other means? So we looked at uh, how Jesus is the final word, the final revelation, uh, the word becoming flesh and this word revealing, you know, um, uh, or communicating everything that God wanted us to know. Um, also that Jesus was the right person to reveal the Father, the heart of God to us, the nature of God, because he is in the bosom of the Father, was close, intimate, and he was the only one who was... Um, you know, had the honor of being intimately close to the Father, and hence he was the only one who could reveal the Father heart of God to us. And then we looked at um, the third thing is God had to become man so that he can suffer in the flesh, um, so that he can, you know, redeem us from sin, um, from being slaves of Satan and uh, from death, uh, and also to make us blameless and holy. Um, and also to take on the sins of the human mankind on himself. So he had to be a human being. And also if he had to die on the cross, he had to be a human being, had to represent us. And through his death, through his blood, you know, he made the full, sufficient, perfect sacrifice. And because of that, we have access uh, to God um, through the throne of grace, um, we can approach God with boldness and receive grace and mercy in our time of need. We can also receive help and also that, you know, we have been justified, made righteous and being redeemed from sin. That means the power of sin over our life is broken. We look at how the power of death over our life is also broken and that we are no longer slaves of the uh, enemy, our enemy or also uh, Satan. Okay. And also Jesus is uh, becoming incarnate. Or his incarnation uh, also gives us a knowledge or the revelation of uh, the understanding of who God is and his ways. So any questions so far? Anyone from the online class or in-person students have any questions? Can you take the mic, please? Just pass on the mic to him. And you mentioned that... Uh... Uh, Jesus on uh, I mean not only uh, broken or tore the curtain I mean you compared that uh, into his body right can you please tell uh, where it's mentioned and who compared it yeah this one what we the the verse that we uh, read right in Hebrews chapter 10 verses 19 and 20 Hebrews 10 19 and 20 he says therefore brothers and sisters since we have confidence to enter the most holy place what gives us the confidence to enter the most holy place the holy of holies yes the blood of jesus i even i'm sure you know you ask any high priest who would want to enter that they would be trembling and shivering because you know they would they they won't even know whether they're going to come back alive so some of them who are you know who might have died in that holy of holy place people even can't you know, go and take out his body, they would have to put a stick and, you know, uh, pull him out, draw him out, because they were so scared to even go near, because, you know, um, even God tells Moses, don't tell, tell the people not to come near the Mount Sinai when he was going to come and give him the laws, you know, and those who touched the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant was going to fall, two of them died, so they lived in this, this fear or terror of that, you know, they can't approach this holy um, God. And then the verse also says, by a new and uh, 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 we can enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body. Open to us through his curtain that is his body. Okay. Yeah. Please take the mic, Sean. <clears throat> yes. Uh, now you're telling, uh, I mean, you are talking about how uh, 
they can how the priest can go in and i mean when the priest like suppose dies inside how will they pull him out or something uh, actually what they used to do is they'll tie a rope around the priest's waist yes then they go inside and in case uh, if he's uh, dead and he doesn't come out for a long time they pull the they pull him out using the rope true yes right thank you yeah Um, Basa, relating to this, um, the veil that was torn in two. Um, so uh, it was in the house. It was like in the tabernacle. In the tabernacle. The temple later yeah. on, which Solomon built. Yes. Yeah, but then uh, what happened to it? I mean, like later on, after it was torn into, because they still practiced it, practiced um, going to the holy of holies. Oh, actually, you mean the Jews? The Jews still mind. sacrifice. They still celebrate a Passover and all, but they know the temple, the curtain of the temple is is torn into two. But I've just left it like that. They won't even, I think, dare to touch it. Yeah. But anyway, the temple is no more. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have another question. Hmm. Um, like, uh, why did Jesus? I mean, why did God have to um, wait, like, for this? long period of time to send his son and i mean the sin was getting more corrupt and more yeah why did he have to wait for? why seven? did he have to wait long for god a, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand days a thousand years is like a day uh, so he doesn't fit into our time period which we look as long but uh, it was not that he was not doing anything he was like we read in hebrews um, uh, it was Hebrews chapter 1, right? Hebrews chapter 1 that we read that in, um, you know, he spoke at various times, okay? In various ways, he spoke to the prophets, but in the fullness of time, the right time. And if you remember last week, I, I did mention why was it the fullness of time? Because it was more than any other period in history that the Jews were waiting or anticipating the coming of the Messiah, because of the Romans, the Roman rule, they were so frustrated with the rules, the laws, the tax, the way they were persecuted. So more than ever before, they were waiting for the Messiah. So it was not that God, um, it was also the environment that, you know, only when people expect, would they look forward? And when the person, when they look forward for something, they would, uh, they would identify it and they would receive it, right? Uh, if you're not expecting, uh, uh, you know, uh, if you're not expecting something to happen or you're not expecting anyone to come home, then you can live in a house which is like totally junk, you know, or dirty or, you know, if we you know when we're expecting somebody, we uh, home, we clean, we make ensure everything is in place and all of those things, we're prepared. What I'm just saying is basically we are prepared okay so you're prepared to come to bible college you you dress up in a certain way you don't come in your night clothes and you know with your hair all you know frizzy and all this one but you you prepared to come to bible college and you come prepared to you bring your things so so even god was looking for when man's uh this right time in which people can you know were anticipating waiting for the messiah to come so that they can receive him and you know when they when they are anticipating in the fullness of time and they will receive it and they will take hold of it and they will look for it and then they would receive it more than any any other season yes any other questions uh, anyone from the online online students any questions Uh, Ma'am, what I can understand is why do the Jews still have, they have this like wailing wall? The weeping wailing wall. Yeah, weeping. Wall. It's because they're, uh, you know, they, um, the Jews don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They're still anticipating uh, the Messiah. They're still looking for somebody who will come and give them political freedom. See? So they're, they're still looking for that. So they're still not accepting Jesus as the Messiah. For them, uh, Curse is the man who hangs on the tree. Yeah. Uh, the weeping, um, the wall. 
it's the temple was destroyed, but I think they have just built this because everything was totally destroyed. Yeah. Yeah, maybe the weeping wall, yes. Okay. Any other questions from our online students? Okay, if not, we will move on. Okay, so we will look at how uh, Jesus bore our sins in his uh, body. Okay, uh, there are a couple of verses there to read. So one of you can read John chapter 1 verse 29. Someone else can read Hebrews 10, 5 and 6. And someone else can read 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24. So please read John chapter 1 verse 29. Uh, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. Thank you. Hebrews 10, 5 and 6. Hebrews 10, 5 and 6. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice an offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Amen. First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. <clears throat> Give it to Francis, yes. First Peter 2, 24. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Amen. Thank you, Francis. So in the incarnation, Jesus took on human flesh, human body, uh, which had been prepared for him. And in this body, he became the Lamb of God. Okay. Uh, look at what uh, John says. You know, when um, next day, when John saw Jesus coming towards him, what does he say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, in the Old Testament context, or for the Jews or for the Israelites, lamb signified what? Sacrifice, okay? Because sacrificial system was such a, had such a prominent place in the religious uh, system of the Israelites. So, uh, you know, we, we know that, you know, he's pointing out to Jesus as the lamb of God. And he's not just talking about that lamb that is just made a sacrifice for any of the sins, but specifically talking about the lamb that was made as a sacrifice for on the day of atonement. Okay. So I told you on the day of atonement, two, uh, there were actually three animals that were chosen. One was a bull, which was made as a sacrifice for the high priest, which who would enter the Holy of Holies. And he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. And there was two goats that were taken, two male goats without blemish or fault or any sickness or disease. And one male goat would be sacrificed and the blood the priest would take and sprinkle it on the mercy seat uh, in the Holy of Holies. That uh, made atonement for the sins of the Israelite race. And the other a goat was not to be sacrificed, but was a scapegoat, which means they would lay hands, the priest would lay hands on that third goat and would put all the sins of the uh, of the Israelite uh, community on that and would send it off in the wilderness for that goat never to um, return. Okay, so um, we see that, you know, um, Jesus became this sacrificial lamb. Okay, he was the sacrificial lamb who made atonement for our sins once for all and has given us the access to approach the holy of holy. So Jesus made the full, sufficient, and the perfect sacrifice for the sins of all humanity once for all. And that is why you and I don't have to make any more sacrifices. Aren't you happy about that? Just imagine every little sin that we do, we'll have to run to the church, we'll have to take our a grain offering or a dove or a, a, a goat and a sacrifice it. But um, no more sacrifice for sins is done because Jesus made the full, sufficient, and <clears throat> perfect um, sacrifice. Amen. Glory to God. Thanks be to God for what he has done for us. So the offering of this lamb was complete, sufficient, uh, you know, what Jesus did. And this lamb had to be without 
blemish. Okay, it had to be a male lamb. So somebody asked that question, why did Jesus have to come as a male? Right? Uh, yeah, so yeah, you asked the question, yes, uh, last class. So one of the reasons a male lamb had to be offered as a sacrifice and a lamb without blemish, no fault, no sickness, nothing on the lamb. It had to be a perfect lamb. And so here was the Jesus, the lamb of God, you know, even though he was um, fully man, he had to come as, he had to be fully God to become, fully God had to, uh, only deity could become fully human because if he had to be born as a human, he would be born in sin because of the, uh, you know, the, the sin that was passed on from Adam. But even though he had this, uh, you know, a, a conception from the womb of Mary, but it was through the Holy Spirit. Okay. So it was not out of sin and hence Jesus was sinless so he had to be fully human he had to be fully divine because only a sinless lamb you know or a sinless person could take on the sins of the entire mankind only a sinless person could die on the cross and take our sins okay upon him um, self so he had to be sinless pure and spotless like that sacrificial lamb and hence john identifies him how does he identify him through the power of the holy Spirit, the revelation of the Holy Spirit, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit he says, hey, look, this is a Lamb of God. So he's testifying to the fact that, hey, all of you are looking for the Messiah. Here is the Messiah. Here is the Lamb of um, God. Okay. Yes. <coughs> uh, Ma'am, when you call Christ as sinless, like, um, we, uh, we, do you mean that um, he... Uh, he can't come like he cannot commit any uh, sin or like uh, he wouldn't commit any sin like he had that sinful nature but he wouldn't do anything again uh, no you can't say that he had the sinful nature he did not have the sinful nature if he had the sinful nature he could not die on the cross for our sins he could not take on the sins of the whole human mankind because only a sinless person can die for the sins of the entire mankind that is why none of us could die for you know, the sins of the whole mankind. There's no God, man, so to say, who can die. Nobody's perfect because we're all born in sin. We have human father, a human mother. And we are all born in sin because sin was passed on from Adam into them, into us. So he does did not have a sin, uh, sinful nature. He was fully human, but he was entirely sinless. But he took on the sins of mankind okay now the reason i asked is because like uh from but did did he have uh, uh, uh could he have sinned yes because he yeah. was human he could have sinned but he overcame temptation and that is why he sets an, an example for us that we can also overcome the power of sin and we can also overcome temptation yeah, now because, because the power that's available in us. Yes. Yeah, now because like as human beings, like sin is like become a part of our uh, as we yeah, has been part of our nature since the very beginning. So, isn't that so that um, I, that's why I asked this question because sin was also is uh, was also part of our yes. Humanity. That is why his conception was sinless. Okay. There was no human father involved. There was. Uh, uh, Mary, okay, but you know, the conception was through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. It was supernatural. Okay, so to say. Yes. Uh, very good question. So, uh, yes, uh, very good question. Um, Mary had the sinful nature uh, in her so how can we say that, you know, um, she, uh, Jesus did not inherit uh, the sinful nature? Look at what Luke chapter 1 verse 35 says. Can somebody read Luke chapter 1 verse 35? Good question. Luke chapter 1 verse 35. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. 
Yeah, in some uh, in some uh, versions it says, therefore the child to be born will be called holy. Holy means what? Set apart, pure, sinless. So here we can say that, you know, of course Jesus did something, uh, I mean God in his plan, he tried uh, to avoid the transmission of sin uh, through the, you know, uh, uh, uniting of uh, man and woman, that is Joseph and and Mary, uh, but that was avoided. There was no transmission of sin. But we can also say that you know Mary um, uh, could have transmitted her sinful nature into um, into um, Jesus. But um, you know uh, God also prevented that transmission of sin, not only from Joseph, but also uh, in a miraculous way from uh, Mary as well. So in a miraculous way, the transmission of sin from Mary was also, you know, prevented from uh, entering into Jesus, even as he was conceived or was, you know, formed in the mother's womb. And how do we know that? Luke chapter 1 verse 35 says, because the child will be holy. Okay, so that is why he had, he was fully human, but he had a supernatural conception and, uh, you know, a supernatural um, growth in his mother's womb. Yeah, good question. Any more questions? Okay, no questions. Okay, then we'll move on. Um, so we are looking at um, how, you know, Jesus is the Lamb of God who made the perfect sacrifice. He also conquered sin in the flesh. Romans chapter 8, verse 3 and 4. Can somebody read that, please? Romans 8, 3 and 4. Nicole can read. Romans 8, 3 and 4. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the place, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful place on account of sin he condemned sin in the place that he uh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do do not walk according to the place but according to the spirit amen thank you so here it says what the law could not do god did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh now what could the law not do see the law was given by whom god if it's given by god it is holy right okay it's just it's spiritual okay the law required that we keep the righteous demands of god okay the law was given so that we keep the righteous righteous demands means that we live right before God. Righteous means being right before um, God. So the law required us to live right before God, but the law did not give us the, did not aid us, did not give us the strength or the support or the help uh, it needed for us to obey the laws. Okay. And none of us can keep all the laws, right? Because our sinful nature is so strong, it reigns. So none of us could keep the righteous requirements of the law. Why? Because sin dominated in our flesh. Sin was even more powerful. And that is why we could not keep all of the righteous requirements of the law. So God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Not in sinful flesh, but in likeness of sinful flesh. That means he was fully human, but accepting that he was sinless. He was not sinful, okay? And Jesus limited himself to every kind of humanness. He took on the physical body, uh, which was a vehicle for sin and ungodliness. How do we know that our bodies are a means for sin and ungodliness? Because this verse says that we could not keep the righteous standards or the requirements of the law. Why? Because sin reigned in our body sin was more powerful was more dominating uh, was more loud uh, than you know uh, the power to keep uh, the uh, law so two reasons why god sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh is um, you know he sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of 
sin, just like we read in this verse, right? Romans chapter 8. Okay, he sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of what? Sin. Okay. Now, this word account of sin in Greek has a sacrificial meaning or a connotation. Okay. If you look at, read the same verse in the New International Version, it says, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. The Amplified Bible says, sending his own son in the guise of sinful flesh, okay, as an offering for sin. Again, here it's talking about um, the day of atonement when the sacrifice was made for the, you know, to find atonement or the covering up of the sins of the entire um, uh, human. Uh, or the entire community of the Israelites. So in this Day of Atonement, there were two goats, sacrificial goats. One was a sin offering, one was a sin bearer. The sin offering was the goat that was cut and the, sin, the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat. That's called a sin offering. And the sin bearer is that second goat in which they would just lay their hands and place all the sins of the entire Israelite community and send that goat as a scapegoat into the uh, wilderness. Okay, so uh, here Jesus became that lamb, which was both the sin offering and also the sin bearer. Okay, he bore our sins and he also made the offering for our sin. So symbolically, Jesus took upon himself, he was our sin bearer, he took upon himself the sins of the entire mankind and also he made this good, sufficient, perfect sacrifice for the, uh, for the sins of the entire mankind. He made it by shedding his own uh, blood. So this is the first thing that uh, was reason why God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Okay. Why? Because he had to be someone like us, identify with us, so that he can bear our sins and also uh, die in our place. The second reason why God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh is so that he could condemn sin in the flesh. Okay? God condemned sin means what? He subdued sin. He overcame, he deprived sin. If you look at it in the Amplified Bible, it says he subdued, he overcame, he deprived it of its power in the flesh. So Jesus in the flesh, he condemned sin means he was able to subdue sin. Okay, he did not give in to sin. He was able to overpower sin and also was able to deprive sin of its power by not yielding to temptation, by not giving in to um, sin. So. You know, even though this is the, the right environment, the right place, because for us, sin reigns in our mortal body. But in that same body, Christ was able to break the power of sin. In that same body, he was able to bear sin and also make the sufficient, full, sufficient, perfect sacrifice for our sins by being sinless himself. So, uh, you know, God broke the power of sin in the human body. So, an example for us that we can also overcome sin in our sinful body, which is a vehicle for sin for ungodliness. Okay, so here it teaches us that we don't have to be subject to the cry or the lust of the flesh or to the power of the flesh or to the dictates of the flesh or how the flesh overpowers us. Instead, we can follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us the power that enables us to, uh, you know, uh, overcome sin and also to keep the law. Remember, the Old Testament people were not able to keep the law. What did God say? He didn't say, I'm going to remove the law. What did he say? I will remove that heart of stone. I'll give you a heart of flesh. And what does he say? I will write my laws upon your heart and mind so whenever we wherever we see you know that um, uh, god uh, uh, you know took away the uh, laws or he abolished the laws he came to do away the laws does not mean that you know now since we are in the new covenant there is no law we have freedom we can do anything and 
everything. There's no rules and regulations. No, we're still under the law. The law is very much abiding. The law is very much good. The law, you know, is, some people read what Romans say, and they say the law could not do it. The law is weak and all of those things. So God did away with the law. No, the law is still functioning. The Ten Commandments is still functioning. But what does God say? I will write my laws upon your heart and mind, and I will put my Holy Spirit in you and my Holy Spirit will help you to obey or to keep the laws. So the law was not done away with. It's not, you know, abolished. But the law is written on our hearts and minds. And now God is giving us an aid or a help how to keep the law. Okay. And how to keep the law? It is with the power of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? Okay. So, um, so that's what it says, this verse says, thus the righteous requirements of the law are fully met because of what Christ has done. Now, how can we keep the righteous requirements of the law? We can't keep it, right? Because we're still all of us in the same human body like people had in the Old Testament. But how can we keep, how can we be right before God even today? Not because that we don't have any laws. We have only grace. We can do anything and the grace of God covers our sin. No, we have the laws. We will be judged. Okay, we have to follow the laws, but it is um, you know the Holy Spirit who will help us. And you know the righteous requirements of the law are fully met. That means is legally satisfied because of what Christ has done. And now we can keep the righteous requirements of the law, or we can keep God's laws, His commandments, because the righteousness of Jesus has been imposed imputed on us. That means the righteousness of Jesus Christ has been put into our account. Are you able to understand? We are not right before God. We have no right standing before God. But because of what Jesus done on the cross and because of he is righteous, his righteousness has been put on us. His righteousness has been put into our account. And that is why we have a right standing with God. And that is also will enable us to keep the law and also the empowerment of the Holy Spirit will enable us to keep the right stand, to keep the righteous requirements of the law. Okay. So another thing what Jesus did in his human flesh is that through his human flesh, what he did on the cross, he was able to, you know, make us righteous and help us to keep the righteous demands of the law. Okay. And we look at Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 18, where it talks about um, threefold purpose. Why did Jesus have to partake in flesh and blood? Why did Jesus have to share in our humanity? We look at these, uh, this uh, uh, chapter, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 18, and look at three purposes for the incarnation and the consequence of it. So can somebody please read Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 18, please? Hebrews 2, 14 and 18. And as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed he does not give it to angels, but he does give it to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining pertaining to God. Pertaining, pertaining, pertaining to, God. to God to make Propitiation, propitiation propitiation for the sins of the people for in that he himself has suffered being tempted he is able to aid those who are tempted okay very important uh, scripture passage i want you all to follow through you know so we see that jesus uh, you know was flesh and blood why so that he could destroy the power of death look at verse 14 he says, in, in as much as then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. That means he himself was flesh and blood. And through his death, 
so that through his death he might destroy the power of death that is the devil so why did god had to become man why did he have to take on full flesh and blood so that you know he might destroy um the one who had the power of death and that is the devil okay so christ shared in our humanity so that through his death you know he could destroy the one who had the power of death that is the devil okay so here the scripture was clearly says in hebrews chapter 2 verse uh, 14 that he had to become flesh and blood so that he can destroy him who had the power of death that is the devil okay uh, look at and you know when jesus died on the cross you know when he um he why did he have to become flesh and blood why couldn't god just destroy the devil why did he have to become human why did he have to take on flesh and blood remember the edenic covenant that god made remember we read that in genesis chapter 3 verse 15 we said the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent the seed of the woman okay that was the covenant god made and so somebody had to come in the human race had to be born of a woman okay can't be god had to be born of a woman and he would crush the head of the serpent and in christ this prophecy is fulfilled so please look at your notes follow through this is very important we're looking at hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 and 18 why did jesus have to come in flesh and blood so that one of the reasons is so that he could destroy him who had the power of death and that is the devil okay you have to use take the mic and okay he had to yeah ma'am god also can send any of his angels for like uh like jesus came now so why god didn't send anyone and he sent his only son you tell me i already taught you that in the last class you tell me why it's good that you have woken up but uh, <laughs> but <laughs> you tell me i already said and i repeated that even when we why why could he not send any angels even when he came we began this second lecture i explained because jesus was the only one who had the honor and the privilege who was very intimate and close remember the bosom of the father maybe you were a little gone off to sleep but if you look at your notes it says in john chapter 1 verse 18 that no one has seen God, the only one who's in the bosom of the father. So Jesus was very close. Bosom means when the mother holds a child very close to herself, Jesus is that close. So he was so intimately one. And because he was so close and intimately one, he is the only one who could reveal everything of the father to us. Yes, God could have sent an angel, but the angel could not have revealed everything about God. The revelation would have been very partial okay and also answering chirag's question i was just thinking about it you know um in revelation it says you know um the angels that were before around the throne you know with uh, two wings they covered their uh, head the two ways they cover their face and they cover their eyes which means that god's presence is so holy that they could not even see him yes so maybe the angels also could not see the holiness of uh see god in reality but maybe just their uh, witness his his manifest glory like you know the israelites did when they when god showed up in, in mount sinai and the tabernacle yes now you got your answer okay so keep awake it will help you yes give it to sean please Uh, my question is that uh, I mean, come, coming back to God's uh, being 100% man, 100% Jesus being 100% man, 100% God. Now, when you say he's, uh, he was 100% God, whatever he did as man, he did it through the power of the Holy Spirit, he did any miracles and all that. So, uh, my question is, how can we still call him 100% uh, God when he's. How can we still? How can we call him 100% God when he came here? Because he did everything that um, as as a man, he used the Holy Spirit in order to uh, do, uh, do uh, in order to heal people, not do many miracles. That is what we're looking in this chapter. Why do we say he was fully God? Because only God 
could reveal himself to mankind. Only God could take on the sins of mankind. Right? No sin. You and I can't. Nobody else can't because we're all born in sin. So it's who can take on the sins of the mankind? He had to be a perfect, sinless, spotless person. And that is only God becoming so man. That's the who could only reveal the Father heart of God? It's only God himself who could reveal himself to us. And how when he reveals himself, how can we see? Only when it's tangible, when you can relate to us as a human being relate. So he became a human being related to us so that we can understand God, we can re receive the revelation, and also that he could make that full, sufficient, perfect sacrifice which is required. And make that uh, sacrifice for sin that is required for reconciliation and for us being justified. So him being sinless is the only characteristic that makes him 100% God. No, he had, I'm, that's what I'm saying, in his deity he had the full nature of God, right? But he seized, or he did not express it, or he did not, uh, he refrained from expressing it and exercising it. Remember, we learned that in the last class. He was fully God. Fully God, fully man. We can't understand that with our human, this one. But he was fully God, fully man. But he refrained from exercising his omnipotence, omniscience, and his omnipotence. Okay. But he didn't, uh, yeah. So doesn't that mean he lived only 100% as man and didn't use any percent of uh, him being son of God? He was fully God, fully man. He lived 100% God, 100% man. It's not something that we can comprehend and understand. It's something that we just receive by faith and try to understand and comprehend. But what, instead of understanding that, we can also see how, why did this God have to become man just for me to understand him, for me personally, for me personally to know him. And because he, God became man, I have access to his throne of grace. I have access to spiritual inheritance, spiritual blessings, to everything. I don't have to make sacrifices. Those are the things that we have to ponder on and make use of in our life and receive that and live in that and walk in that. Because trying to comprehend all of this is not going to fit our logical reasoning and understanding, so to say. Okay. We understand how much we can. The rest we we take by faith, but we can see. Yes, when God, why, why, when God could become man, why could He not stop the transmission of sin from uh, from uh, uh, Mary into Him? Yeah. See, why could He not refrain from using? He's God. See, you should understand that He's God. He can stop doing things. He can do things. You know, He does not need His will you know he's sovereign he can do things strong will and more than us we can't comprehend him with our understanding okay. but he was fully god fully man operated okay. fully totally and that's why we're seeing how so you need to try to understand how you know even as we're looking you need to comprehend understand for yourself that is why i'm saying please go back and please read the notes because you just can't li listen to a lecture for two hours because you know I understand. No, in no one can listen, concentrate for fifty minutes. Attention span at the most is twenty. The rest thirty is gone. So that rest thirty you have to read. Otherwise, you will come up with these questions, and these are fundamental truths. That's why I'm saying, please, please take time to read. I also take time to read and prepare, even though I'm teaching this subject after so many years. You know, I'm learning so many new things. It applies to me as well. Very, very important. Others, you will still be very confused. Yeah. Um, uh, actually, Christ shared in our humanity to destroy the power of death. So uh, we come back to the Genesis 3.15 that the seed of woman would crush the head of the serpent. Yes. So Christ came to fulfill this prophe prophecy. Yes. So uh, I mean, the, when we when we consider this Genesis three fifteen, the, the the seed of woman would crush the head. It doesn't apply for us, uh, or it's it's only for the Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ, Amma. Yes, because you look at the seed. There is a capital S. Uh, it's not it's talking for the, about the seed of the woman. It's not for the, all the human beings, Amma. The prophecy. Uh, it could also be inclusive where we can, uh, like what, what I'm going to say, when Jesus died on the cross, you know, he crushed the 
head of serpent he fulfilled the prophecy okay uh, but you know he also uh, when it says here he destroyed the devil the greek word for destroy there means to paralyze to undo uh, to bring to nothing to make to no effect okay that which which means christ reduced the power of of satan to nothing and also we see that he shared this victory with us so even we as a seed of woman we can crush the head of serpent because of the authority that has been given to us and because of our spiritual position now what is our spiritual position we are seated at the right hand of god right why are we what is our spiritual position when we mean that we are seated at the right hand of god that means we have been given power over to disarm every principality like we read uh, in colossians chapter 2 verse 15 that on the cross jesus disarmed principalities and power he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them so these principalities and powers are these demonic hosts that is being referred to how do we know it's demonic hosts because we read this in ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 where it says for our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against rulers against authorities against powers of this dark world against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms Okay, so when Jesus died, he undoed the uh, paralyzed, he brought to nothing, uh, made to no effect the uh, Satan's power. Okay, and uh, he on the cross, he stripped Satan of all his power. He openly displayed his triumph in his heavenly realms and Christ destroyed uh, the devil. Uh, so, you know, notice when Christ defeated Satan on the cross, he did it as a human being, as flesh and blood, not as deity. So in his humanity, Christ actually defeated devil as a representative of the human race. Okay. And Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10 says that he is the captain of our salvation. Look at your notes. Follow through in your notes. It will be easy. Uh, so your mind is also concentrating. Okay. He is a captain of our salvation, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, uh, which means that, you know, Jesus defeated the devil on our behalf as our captain. Okay? So what does that mean? When he defeated devil on our behalf as our captain, we also share in his victory. When the king, now suppose you're the king, the king of Bangalore City goes for war, and the king of Bangalore City wins the war, are we all going to be slaves of that of that other king he fought against? No. We also, whether irrespective of whether we went for the war or not, we also celebrate in that victory. That victory is all, also ours. We are also living in freedom. We have won the war, right? Even if we don't go to the battlefield. So Jesus is our captain of our salvation. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10. So why did God have to become man? So that he can be, he can die as a representative in our place. So that he can defeat Satan. And he, as a captain of our salvation, we also receive that blessing. Why? Remember, Adam, when Adam sinned, all of us, we all fall short of the glory. We also receive sin. Okay? Even though we are not, we are great, 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 grandchildren of Adam. We're not directly connected to him. But we're all born in sin. All of you can say, how how unfair. But look at what God has done. He became man. And he died on the cross. The, the victory is all, also us. When he died on the cross, he broke the power of sin. It applies to us. The power of sin is automatically broken in our lives. When he died on the cross, he defeated death. Death is automatically defeated in us because he's taken our place. Just like Adam sinned, we receive sin. Christ died as a human being. We also receive all of these things. So it was important for him not to die as deity, but as humanity so that he can represent us, so that we can receive from what he has done. Are you able to understand now? Yes. So because he defeated Satan on the cross, he's our captain. We that that person is also defeated. Did you did you remember? So the king goes for battle, he defeats Goliath. So when he defeats Goliath, 
it's as if to say I also defeated Goliath, even though I didn't go for war against Goliath, because I'm part of that kingdom. I belong to that um, kingdom. So we see that Jesus shares his victory for us with us, and hence we have the victory. So that Genesis 3:15 Edenic covenant also applies to us that we can now have the power to crush Satan uh, whenever he comes against us. Yes. Sean, quickly, because time is up. Please take the mic so that other students can listen. I didn't match. So you can say, say the same thing, that doing cricket match when you have India versus Pakistan. So when India wins, we say that India has won. But well, actually the place that they won. But we say that India has won. Like that. Yes. Yes. Okay, he's talking about the cricket match and saying when, when India wins against Pakistan, it's like all of us as Indians win. Yes. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Uh, online students, you've been very quiet today. No questions, online students? Ma'am, uh, anything about the exam? Please, uh, online students, please type out your questions in the chat section if you have. Yes. But anything about the exams for this coming uh, week? Yeah, I'll, I'll discuss that later okay. with you. Okay, no questions. If there are no questions, I thought of finishing this and the next lesson, but uh, not being able to. Anyway, we'll continue next class. Thank you all for joining our class. Please, 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 online students, in-person students, read your notes. Very important so that you can come back next week and be able to understand. Okay? Thank you for joining class. Have a good uh, day. Thank you. Thank you.